One of the first things that's normally asked of you in an exam question is to add some random movement to one of the non-player characters. This makes sense. This is a really simple way of making enemies move around the game world that you've built. And fortunately, a lot of the material online at the moment is based on the old style WJEC exams, where they gave you an absolute shed load of code to do this and expected you to be able to read what they'd written and use it effectively. Now, not anymore. They've pretty much stripped it back to a blank file and gone, go on, do it. Please don't worry too much if you see a command called move in old materials. That's something that we're not using anymore. Anyway, it's all the more reason to watch the rest of my videos, as they work for the current specification. <clears throat> uh, make sure to like, comment and subscribe. Let's get this channel monetized! In our example, I've added a treasure chest and some angry parrots to the game. And the idea is that the parrots will be wandering around the island, ready to peck that poor pirate right in the face. We will need to add some code to the object that we want to be moving. We want the parrot to move, so let's start by double-clicking on the parrot subclass. This brings up the code editor for the parrot. The bit we care about is in the act method. This is the code that runs for every frame of the game. So this is where we want to be typing. It very helpfully tells us where to put the action code. So let's start thinking about how we can make the parrot move in any of the directions on screen. As anyone who's ever owned a games console knows, we've got four main directions. Up, down, left and right. And what we want to happen is for the parrot to decide at random which direction it needs to be moving in this frame. This means that we've got four different directions to choose between. So let's try and apply some computational thinking to the problem of generating four directions and picking which one of them we want to move in. We could enumerate, or give a number to, each direction. Let's start with simply up being zero and working around the compass in a clockwise direction. Right becomes one, down becomes two, and left becomes three. So what we need to do is generate a random number between those values. Why start at zero? Well. One, it's because I'm a computer scientist and that's habitual, but secondly, it's because the function in Greenfoot that will do the random number generating for us is zero indexed itself, in that it will give us a number between zero and the value just below what we type in. This code will create an integer called direction that is populated from the Greenfoot random number generator. Oh, see that beautiful Java syntax? It's verbose, but it does what it says in the tin. The way this is working is that it's going to the Greenfoot library, then calling the getRandomNumber function. Now, this function takes an argument, and, and that's a value that goes into the brackets. The argument it needs is the amount of values to pick from. So, if we put 4 in here, then we'll get one of 4 random integers. Remember that this is zero indexed, so we'll never get a 4 just the values 0, 1, 2, and 3. It's also really easy to generate different ranges of numbers by changing this one value. So uh, if a question only wanted the object to move in two directions, we could replace the number with a 2. Anyway, now we've got a bit of code to generate our random number, we can put this into the code act method. Let's type that up. Fantastic. Now, notice that we've got a semicolon at the end of the line. In Java, this is the equivalent of a full stop that we'd use in English. It tells the computer that the line has ended. Don't forget these. If you do miss them out, then when you click compile, it will shout at you like a PE teacher without a whistle. Now, we've got the direction. So, we need to tell the parrot what to do when the variable is at different values. Let's start with a simple if statement to check to see if the direction is zero. Uh, that's the first value that we'll deal with. The syntax here is straightforward. We've got our if itself, then the condition to be evaluated in the round brackets, and hey, the condition even has the double equals to say, is this the same as that? 
Java now uses curly braces to explain which code block to execute if the condition is true. In this case, if the random value we created, called direction, is equal to zero. Then we'll put the code inside the curly braces to both rotate it and move it. But which direction did we decide zero was? Ah, now we said it was up. So let's add a quick comment to remind ourselves what we're doing here. A single line comment starts with a slash slash and should turn gray so we know it's being ignored by the compiler. And the next step is to rotate the parrot in the direction we're working on. In this case, we need to point the parrot up. Now we need to work out how to do this. And we need to look at the parrot's sprite, its image. And we'll see that the parrot is pointing to the right by default. If we were to stick a compass on top of our parrot and write out the standard bearings on them, that's a description of how many degrees the object needs to turn in a clockwise direction to face that way, we can work out how much to turn the parrot to get it to face in any direction. Start by rotating the compass until the zero degree marker is facing in the same direction that our sprite is. This allows us to get a bearing, uh, get it, bearing, maths, uh, anyway, uh, it allows us to work out the bearing that we need to point the sprite in to look like it's going to be moving in the correct direction. Now, we're dealing with the up direction, so according to our compass we need to set the rotation of the sprite to 270 degrees to get it pointed upwards. Once again, we've got a lovely bit of self-documenting code to write, which is this set rotate function. All we need to type in as an argument is the angle that we want the sprite to face. We'll take this from our bearing diagram, 270 for an upwards direction. So this is the code that we need to add into the if statement. Cool, so now our sprite points upwards and let's move it upwards too. What we need to do is move the sprite up by one. In order to do this, we need to walk through a few steps. Firstly, we need to find out where the parrot is at the moment in the world. Then we need to work out what offset, what change we need to include to place it in the new location. Finally, we need to move the thing. Finding out where it is now is actually quite easy. The object exists in our grid, so we can simply ask it for its current position. We have to do this in two stages. First, to get the location in the x-axis, you know, across in the horizontal plane, and then do the same thing for the y-axis, up and down in the vertical plane. So now we've got the current location, we need to think a little bit about how the movement we want to achieve will affect the x and the y-axis. This grid represents the world. You'll see we've got the x-axis going across and the y-axis going down. Now both of these start in the upper left cell at zero. Shocking, I know, but it's another zero index value. And then it increases as we go right or down. Now, if you're experienced with coordinate systems in mathematics or geography, you might be thinking that's not normal. But I'm here to tell you that it's perfectly normal for computers, as this is exactly the way screens work. They count upwards from the top left screen as we go right and as we go down. So let's get the current location of the parrot. Okay, so x is 1, y is 2, uh, and let's watch it move upwards. Now it's sitting at 1, 1, so it's actually decreased in the y-axis by 1. This means we need to take away 1 from the current y-axis value. Well, it's a good job we've got that already, isn't it? Now let's look at the code we need to set the new location. Oh, this is why I love Java. Look at that nice, obvious function name, set location. And it has two arguments, the new x-axis position and the new y-axis position. First, we'll take the current positions in, like that, and then we'll include the offset. There we go. We've now got a solid line of code to add to our program, one that will set the location of our object to the current x-axis position and the current y-axis position minus one, meaning it will move it up. Let's get that into our code then. Great. Well, now we've got all the code set up for one direction. Uh, this means the hard part's pretty much over, and the next few steps are just us copying and pasting this chunk and changing some of the values. 
So let's do that. Copy the entire if statement and paste it just below. Let's change the value of the direction to 1. And now we'll take a look at which direction we said was 1. 1 seems to be pointing right. So let's change the comment to remind us of that. The next thing we need to change is the angle of rotation. Let's go back to our compass diagram to see what angle we said we'd need to turn to face right. Ah, an easy one. It's zero degrees. This means this is the direction the sprite was originally pointing. Well, let's get that changed in the code. Lastly, we need to change the set location code. We need to work out the offset needed in order to get the character moving one cell to the right. Again, we know where it is now with these get x and get y values. Uh, so let's get that into the code. But what about the offset? Here, the parrot starts at position 1, 2. And when it's moved to the right, it's landed at position 2, 2. That's an increase of 1 in the x-axis this time, meaning our offset is plus 1 for the first argument in our function. There we go. Let's go and make that change to the code. With that done, let's move on and copy and paste that if statement. This time, we'll increase the direction to 2 and deal with the situation when the random function has given us direction number 2. Let's have a quick reminder what direction we said we'd use number two for. Oh yes, it's down. So let's get that added to the comment. Don't forget, the comment is just there to remind us of what's going on. It's quite easy to lose track if you don't do this. Okay, so down. What was the rotation angle we needed for that? Let's take a look. Okay, 90 degrees in this case. Let's get that into the code. That's cracking. How about the set location code? Well, we know how to get the current location. There's our get x and get y code again, but what about the offset for down? In our virtual world, the parrot is moving from position 2, 1 all the way down to position 2, 2. So the y-axis is being increased by 1. This gives us an offset of plus 1 in the right-hand argument for our function. OK, let's get that typed up. We're nearly there. One more to go. Copy and paste that big chunk again. Let's change the value it's looking for to 3. Can we have the reminder graphic for which direction number 3 was, please? Aha, it's left. The only direction we haven't done yet. Let's update our comments so that it's clear what's happening. Now, onto our rotation. We're changing the argument here, and we need to change the rotation angle we need so that our parrot points to the left. In our bearing diagram, it says 180 degrees is what we want. So let's get that written down. Last but not least is to adjust our set location line for moving to the left. Again, we know all this stuff now, get x and get y, will get the location of our parrot in the x and y axis. But the interesting thing is always the offset. Oh, look at this beautiful animation. The parrot is gracefully moving from 3-2 and landing in 2-2. The change is in the x axis, and it's reducing it by 1. This means that the offset, minus 1, gets put on the left-hand argument of the set location function. So in it goes, and boom, we're done. That was a long process, wasn't it? Click the old compile button and just check that the compiler is happy with you. Ours is, so happy days. Let's move back to the main Greenfoot window and see if the random movement actually works. Click run and, oh yes, it works. Look at those little parrots rotating and moving at random. But they're moving about as slowly as my Nanda's on his Zimmer frame. It's worth adjusting the speed slider so they're moving at something that feels like a normal speed. There we go. Done. Dusted. Finished. With that working, anything else that needs to move randomly, we can copy and paste this entire chunk of code into that other object to help that move randomly as well. But you must go back to your compass diagram with the bearings on it and make sure that you update the angles to something that's appropriate for the sprite you're working on. Otherwise, your actor will be pointed in the wrong direction when it's moving. No one wants that. It's confusing. This code will actually help us out and form the basis to the next big skill, which is moving the user-controlled character around, usually with the arrow keys. Take a look at the next video for that skill. Before you do that, though, go and practice this. Go and memorize the key functions and bits of code that you need. 
when you sit in that exam in controlled conditions, you really don't want that to be the point where you realize you don't remember the function names. Go and practice.